Hi everybody, my name is Matt Ketrick. I'm here from Northern Arizona University. And I wanted to show you guys a little bit about the work that we've been doing on assisted migration at NAU. So how are we going to respond to the challenge of climate change? Climate change is currently creating mismatches between conditions that species are adapted to and the conditions they're encountering as a result of that climate change. In this diagram here, you can see under a normal climate scenario, throughout the range of a tree, there are cold adaptive members of that species in the colder part of the range warmer adapted members of that species in the warmer part of that range. Under a climate change scenario, we see that the climate has altered the conditions that the species are living in. So now there are cold adapted species in the warm part of the range, warm adapted species in the part of the range that's become hot. And as a result, we're seeing mortality here with these gray white trees. So one solution to this is intraspecies assisted migration. Um, what happens under that scenario is that there is a movement of trees from the warm part of the range up into an area that's going to become warm under a climate change scenario. And so you can see as a result that once that climate changes, there are then going to be more and more functional trees in that warmer area. As opposed to um, <clears throat> moving an entire species into, into a new range, which is also sometimes associated with this migration. But this talk is going to focus solely on intra-range migration. However, there's a problem with this in that these plants initially may be a poor fit for their new locations because we're moving them before the climate changes, and there's going to be a period of time where they're not adjusted to their new conditions and they're going to struggle initially in being established. So where does this study fit in? We're asking, how can we buffer those new transplanted species and try to help them establish initially before the climate changes? Um, asking, what important community relationships can we use to support assisted migration? And can we possibly use facilitation by a common neighbor, Salix Exigua, uh, to support the example of transplanted populus frumontii? Salax exigua has been shown to be less sensitive to climate change, so it's a good candidate in this case to possibly be used in support of assisted migration. Okay, so once again, specifically we're asking, could multi-species assisted migration within a plant's existing range lead to more successful transplants? So again, our target species for this study was Populus fremontii. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that tree, now, but it's a Foundation species in southwestern riparian ecosystems. It provides ecosystem services and it also provides a lot of space for other species in that ecosystem. So it's a foundational species that really helps keep that ecosystem healthy and functioning. And it reproduces primarily by using seasonal flooding in the southwest. So it's extremely important that these plants get enough water. <clears throat> and it's under stress from climate change non-native introductions, and flood regime alteration. In this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on climate change. So specifically, <clears throat> what research questions did we ask? We looked at, does populous transfer distance affect populous growth? So does the distance that we transfer a populous seedling from its source to a new site affect how that seedling grows? Do paired populous grow faster than singletons? So does populace growing next to a salix grow faster than a populace growing alone? Does salix partner source population affect populace growth? So does the source origin of that salix partner affect how the populace grows? And are there river patterns that could explain populace growth threats? So you'll see in a minute that this is a study of the common garden. Sometimes there are interactions that are unexpected with herbivores um, in these settings where you move plants into new locations. So we wanted to try to take that into account. And then lastly, as an attempt to try to look at mechanism, um, we asked, do root extracts of common riparian associates affect populist growth? 
And I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. But first, uh, what is a common garden? I mentioned that briefly just a second ago. A common garden is an area where you take plants of the same species, gathered from throughout the range of that species, plant them in a common environment, so in the same place, uh, with the idea that any differences in growth that you then see at that site are due to differences in genetics of those plants, because we're assuming that they're going to be growing under the same conditions. So if they're growing differently, the reason for that is likely their genetic makeup. This study was conducted specifically at the Chevron Creek Common Garden, which is near Winslow, Arizona, quite near the Little Colorado River, and it was conducted in an area that was probably a tamarisk band that was mechanically cleared and replanted. It was replanted with cottonwood and carroty willow uh, in rows, and it was again either cottonwoods planted alone or cottonwoods planted with a willow partner. So in the summer of 2015, using the already established garden, we conducted a productivity study looking at the growth rate of populous Fremontii with and without a Salix partner. Again, this is an opportunistic study, so this garden was already planted when we conducted our study. Um, at the garden, they had had high mortality in their plantings due to some problems with irrigation. So we used the available plants that were already there, which resulted in some unbalanced study design, as you may notice in some of my slides, but that's the reason for that. So a little more on the setup of the garden. Again, the plants were planted in rows, and they were planted either with a populace paired with a salix or a populace alone. All the plants were trip irrigated, and again, they were from a variety of source populations. So what are those source populations? Uh, this is a map of the sources for our trees for this study. Uh, Winslow is about here. And you can see we have uh, quite a variety of source locations. Uh, some are from, are from higher, colder elevations, some are from lower elevations. Um, and originally there were even more source populations, but as I said, some died after the planting process initially. Okay, and then to compare all these plants from different sites, we had to somehow categorize them so we could compare them. And what we did was we categorized them all into three climate transfer distance groups based on the distance from their source to the garden near Winslow. Um, these transfer distances are in degrees Celsius. They're not in kilometers or miles or anything like that. Um, it's a difference in temperature, mean annual maximum temperature from the source to the garden. So there's low, medium, and high, and we'll talk a lot about those in a moment. We estimated biomass and growth rate. Uh, we used published biometric equations, which is just a way of calculating biomass from taking some measurements. Uh, we also measured the diameter and stem base as part of that, and then simply made a rough estimate of growth rate by dividing the biomass by the plant age, which we knew because we know when the plants were planted. Uh, also, our autocard of river sampling, uh, we estimated that uh, using these methods here um, in order to look for possible unexpected interactions between source and the garden site again. And for this analysis, we pooled some of our groups so that we had enough plants in each group to do some accurate statistics. Uh, for our statistics, we use very simple uh, analysis of variance and linear regressions. Um, we log transform the data where necessary. We used R for our statistics and used an alpha of 0.05. Also, as part of this, as an attempt to look at mechanism, we conducted a root greenhouse uh, experiment uh, uh, hypothesizing that maybe root exodus were what was causing the differences in populist growth. Uh, so we tried to design a simple experiment to look at that. And what we did was we grew populist seedlings and treated them with different root extracts from common riparian neighbors using salix, tamarisk, populus, and then a control group to see if there was an effect from any of those. We replotted 50 seedlings, um, allowed them to grow for three weeks, treated them weekly with these root extracts, and then ran the experiment for two months. What did we find? Overall, uh, initially we found that populus transfer distance alone did not impact the populist growth rate. So this is populist growth over here, 
and I thought that was transfer distance on the bottom. And although it may look like it, there's no statistical difference between any of these groups. So we didn't find an effect of populist transfer distance on how the populist trees grew in the garden. We did, however, find higher populist growth in pairs. So we found unexpectedly that when populist was paired with the salix, it grew significantly faster than when it was growing by itself as a singleton. When we looked at the identity of the willow partner, we found that populace grew fastest when it was paired with a low transfer distance partner. So here again, we have populace growth on this side, salix temperature transfer distance on the bottom. And you can see that the low transfer distance willow partner resulted in higher populace growth. Um, so this is interesting. This is among paired populace. We're seeing a different effect with a certain subset of partners. So the low transfer distance partner is showing more growth. Once we saw that, uh, we wanted to go back and look and see if we included both populist and salix source, if we would then see a more complex pattern, and that's exactly what we found. So this is a kind of a complicated diagram, but I'll uh, walk you through it here. Um, again, this is populist growth here, and then on the bottom, there's populist transfer distance. And then these colored lines are the transfer distance of the willow partner. So if we look at, say, this kind of moderate transfer distance down here for the populace, the effect of the willow partner varies. So when that moderate transfer distance populace is paired with a low transfer distance willow, it gets a much more positive effect than when it's paired with a high transfer distance willow or a medium transfer distance willow. So this is very interesting in the context of assisted migration because if we're moving trees, say, one to three degrees, which is the recommended amount for a transfer of populace, then one way we could possibly buffer them through that initial period where they may not survive is to pair them with a low transfer distance salix, so a local salix, a local canopy willow, and that could increase their survivability in a restoration situation. Um, this is just the uh, Specifics of this test. Populous transfer distance was significant. The main effects of the salix temperature group were significant. And then the interaction between populous distance and salix temperature group was also significant. In our periphery uh, examination, we also found another interesting pattern, which was that we found higher periphery when, it, when the populace was paired with a low salix uh, partner. So, those populace paired with low salix are having higher herbivory and they're also having higher growth, higher growth rate. Um, so that was unexpected. Um, in the greenhouse experiment, the results. Again, remember these are all populous seedlings treated with different root extracts. Um, we found in our treatment groups that none of them were significantly different from the control of the treatment. Um, so we didn't find any strong results there. We did find kind of interesting, however, though, that it looks like there's a negative effect of treating populace with a populace root extract. So that populace grew less. And that category is smaller than the salix. So this wasn't exactly what we were hoping for, but um, it is interesting that the two species involved in our proposed facilitation here are the ones that showed a significant difference in the greenhouse experiment. However, this is by no means definitive, um, but it may be an area for further study. It could indicate some kind of below ground interaction going on. Uh, we found similar results for root biomass as well. Leaf biomass is the same pattern again. And for stem biomass, they were all, all the same and were different statistically. So to recap, uh, at Shed 1 in the common chart, populace grew faster uh, with a salix partner, especially if that partner was local. And then populace with a local partner that was salix also had a higher periphery, which may mean that they could be supporting more arthropods, which could have significant positive effects for the community. You know, they could cascade outwards, um, offering more food for birds and things like that. And then also um, in the greenhouse, we didn't find anything definitive, but we may think that the mechanism is tied into below ground interactions such as chemical signaling possibly, or perhaps some kind of mycorrhizal interaction. So what are the implications of this? Um, this is an interesting application of facilitation 
that could possibly be used as a restoration tool. It's very common in agriculture, um, so perhaps we could borrow that idea and use it for our plantings in the field and restoration. Uh, there was a role of genetics, so the identity of both the salix and the populace was important to get the best outcome for the populace seedlings. And as far as value for assisted migration, this is a very specific case, but if we're just talking about populace in the southwest, we're trying to transfer trees from warmer environments into cooler ones in preparation for climate change, it could make a lot of sense to try to pair them with salix, especially if those salix are local. So it'd be really interesting to try this uh, in the field. Acknowledgements. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. So, out of all the various studies of facilitation and restoration that I've read, I mean, you have some great results here. There's clearly something going on. So, I'm just curious. What do you think is going on if it's not a, a really nice thing, or if it's something not obvious with the low ground? I mean, especially with the, the impact of being the, the low distance salix causing the most profound result. I think that it's probably a mycorrhizal interaction. So I'm not sure if everyone here knows what mycorrhizae are, but they're soil fungus that, that help uh, plants to survive heat, nutrients, um, and moisture. Populus and salix are in the same family. So I would speculate that perhaps there's a similarity there in the kinds of mycorrhizal um, growth that they have, and that in this site, because it used to be a tamarisk field, perhaps they're trying to rebuild that network, so say lots of populace together can rebuild the network faster. We haven't tested that yet. I'd, I'd like to do something along those lines, but we haven't gotten to it yet. Anyone, anyone else? Um, regarding your herbivory um, portion, were there particular families that responded overall, or what, what kind of community was indicated to having that response? Our, I guess our, our herbivory measurements were extremely coarse. We basically just did presence, absence of herbivory, and we didn't try to collect any arthropods to see what it was. And it's not an area that I know a lot about, um, so I can't really tell you uh, exactly what it was. I think it was some kind of uh, leaf eating bug that made any kind of like asymmetrical holes in the leaves. Um, but again, that was kind of just something that we did to add more depth to try to find a pattern. Um, but I definitely need to investigate that more if I, if I have time. Yep. I have um, two questions. So uh, you mentioned that. Salix is less sensitive to climate change. What did you mean by that? Are you just talking about temperature? Are you talking about water stress? You, yeah. Yeah, I should have been more clear. That was temperature. There's a, a few papers that show um, that salix source is less important under different conditions. So salix from a wide variety of areas can do well under a wide variety of temperature regimes. That's what I was saying there. Okay. Um, and then my other question was, do, are you, within your common garden, are you looking at other environmental conditions, so like soil moisture? Like, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, oftentimes irrigation is not uniform, even though we try to make it uniform, um, and that could definitely be affecting, you know, your interactions and, and also the arthropod community. And those things. So I'm wondering if you're looking at that I haven't done soil and moisture measurements yet. I do plan to in the future. Um, and I think that's a major concern that I have as well with this. The only thing that I found that might kind of address that a little bit is the genetic pattern, which I don't think soil and moisture would necessarily come for that, although it could. But that was one thing that kind of got my attention when I was looking at this data that made me want to pursue it further. Did, did you look uh, to follow up on that question? Did you um, look at soil salinity? Is that something that had an effect on on growth at all? Within this garden, we took measurements uh, in general for the entire garden. 
but we didn't specifically sample next to each plant to see if there was variation there. But we did. We took uh, 30 samples throughout the seven-acre garden. Um, we didn't find a significant level of variation just doing a simple ANOVA test, um, but that's as far as we took it. It was pretty quick and dirty. Anybody else? 